Hi, everyone. I am uh, Katsu Tanaka, a photographer. Thanks for coming today and a uh, rainy day in New York. And thanks for watching the uh, uh, online live view now. Uh, so uh, I'm in this business about over 25 years. And now I have like a two kind of body work. One is as an uh, editorial photographer and a photojournalist. Uh, I work for like, a magazine and publish a book and do the, uh, some photo exhibit. Another part is, I, oh, particularly the last like, seven, eight years, I'm, I have a huge passion for conducting like, a photo workshop, taking my guests to the world's most exotic and remote places and teach photography. So combining these two expertise and experience, uh, today I will talk about uh, travel photography. Uh, this is end of June, so you may plan like a summer vacation, taking lots of pictures, or some of you might take a course or the photography trip. So uh, my hope is uh, through this presentation, every one of you can uh, pick up some new new technique, new tips, and uh, trying to adapt to your upcoming trip. Uh, but I have to warn you. Uh, if you have like a family vacation and you're still trying to follow what I will talk about today and trying to adapt it, you might be in trouble because uh, you may stuck in the one place and taking photo hours and hours and then your family can get really mad on you. So <laughs> be careful. Uh, so the, uh, this presentation, uh, there's like a three section. First, I will show you some of my like, travel stories and trying to show how professional photographer prepare and compose a story and article. The second part is a little more specific and the uh, technical, and how you can research, plan the, the trip, or the uh, how you plan the day, how you compose the frame and put the drama in the frame. So that's number two. At the uh, then number three, I also like to introduce the uh, one of my photo workshop. Uh, that's where I take my guests to the uh, faraway places, and I like to show you. Um, at the end, well, thanks to the, the sponsorship with the uh, uh, Nikon, we have all the new gears, and I brought my also gears, and I will show you how to pack, how to travel with these many equipment. And you can have a, a question at, uh, at the very end, and uh, I'm more than happy to answer that. Okay, so let's start. Ready? Okay. Uh, so uh, travel photography can be really broad ideas. So uh, by showing some of the story I did, and then uh, I would like to uh, show the different angle, different subject, how I approach. Uh, so let's start uh, like a travel photography based on one city. I will show you some of the images uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, I've been traveling to Brazil over the last 15, 20 years. I'm in love with the, uh, the Rio. Rio is one of the, my favorite city in the world. Uh, this is the article I did uh, right before the Olympics, like uh, three years ago. Uh, People heard about Rio, but they didn't know what was happening before the Olympics, where the old uh, international attention come to. Uh, so my, my intention was trying to show what the city is about, the real, real scene. Uh, I started this picture as the front page of the article. Uh, normally, I try to put all the essence into one frame, one picture. Uh, you can see the uh, unique shape of mountains back, and this is called the uh, Ipanema Beach, if you have heard of it. So the, uh, the incredible fresh energy and fun-loving people at the same time, very sentimental, emotional feel, all mixed together, that's real. So I will always start the article with the image that shows, like a signature image that shows the place. Then. I also try to get a little broader view, like a bird's eye view, of the city. You can see uh, the bay, beautiful bay, with the, again, unique form of mountains. And of course, the Christ on top of the uh, hill, 
overlooking the, uh, the people in Rio. Uh, we call the carioca, is the uh, local uh, term uh, explained about the, the people. Uh, this is the uh, countdown uh, fireworks uh, New Year's Day, a uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, here in New York, everybody knows the Times Square countdown. But compared to ours in the Times Square, there is a way bigger. This is like a million people coming to the Copacabana Beach. You see the old uh, bluish color on the beach. Actually, they are all in white shirts, white t-shirts, white pants. Uh, this is a part of the uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, religious uh, uh, ceremony. So although they come and they get crazy, as you know, they get a Brazilian, but this is also a very sacred moment. So they still uh, maintain those, the roots, you know, the people originally came, uh, the Portuguese people came to the uh, Brazil and the colonized and they brought a lot of Afri African slaves. So they got the mixed culture of the uh, African and also the European. Uh, this is like a normal weekend on the Ipanema Beach. You can count how many soccer balls are flying on. Uh, Rio, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, in Rio, the beach culture is a big part of their daily life. They have beautiful beaches, uh, white sand, uh, the tropical mountain just behind. This is a gathering place, also like a social gathering place, uh, entertainment place, a soccer field. The, the being close to Rio, uh, the beach is so meaningful for them. Uh, but the beach could be really, really complex place. Uh, people come out, beautiful men and women, old train, get a beautiful shape, but they do nothing on the beach. They just stand and showing off. This is how they feel the identity, self-identity. It's a very complex place. You see the poor and the rich and the, the very congested area. So some people, this is the beach is the only place to show their identity. So that really, really impressed me. Of course, the Rio is the, you know, was chosen as a place for the sports, world <coughs> biggest sports events. And they do this kind of, this is like uh, open water swim competition. And uh, 20, well, two, 3,000 people participate. This kind of thing happens all the time. It's a beautiful weather. And the, uh, the sound, nature surroundings are all, always you know, welcome in the sports events. So it was a piece of cake for them, actually. You know, the Olympic was very successful. There was a lot of people questioned before. It could be too dangerous. They are too lazy. But you know, it was absolute success. And of course, Rio is famous for this, the uh, carnival, uh, world biggest party. This is the, like a stadium with the uh, 3,000, 40, I mean 30,000, 30, 40,000 people, spectator come and see to watch the parade. And the parade is actually the competition. So there are about 10 groups compete within the 90 minutes of performance, like a street opera, uh, selecting the theme, and then uh, they dance and they perform. Uh, so this is a, a one-time uh, like a party moment for every uh, people in Rio. Incredible dancing, music, and costume. But at the same time, in the back alley, you know, they changed the street into like a, their own small party place. Uh, you see the, the musician at the corner, and then uh, they, they just gather and dance. You know, just a daily thing. Uh, but it's also a very chaotic place, and the street life is always cha chaos, which I love. And then the dogs are very chaotic. <laughs> but at the same time, they have a very religious uh, life. 90% uh, of people are, are Catholic, and they go to the church, and then they're very religious. And you don't normally see this side of the Rio. So my approach for the travel story in Rio, this is just what the city is like. You know, the uh, combining the energy and the chaos and the party and the samba, but at the same time, what's their daily life is like. 
And uh, they also have a beautiful infrastructure. Uh, not many people know, knew the uh, uh, know, uh, Rio used to be the capital of the country. So that's where all the money and the wealth. So that time, they built those uh, beautiful opera house, and library, and uh, uh, municipal buildings. So this is how we combine whole different element to show uh, a typical city story. And the people call it like a marvelous city. Uh, again, even after the Olympics gone, and they are a little bit suffering uh, economically, but I'm sure it remains just the most beautiful city in the world. OK, another story. Again, focus on the uh, city. You may travel to, you know, during the summer vacation, go to the one city, another, and if you're going to take a picture, how do you compose? How do you get the angle? How do you show the, the city? This is a very typical story I do. Uh, Budapest is one of my favorite cities in Europe. Uh, along the river of Danube, uh, mm -hmm. both sides, the Buda and the Pass. You see this separate town and they emerge into one about late 18th century, I guess. Uh, so, so they were trying to build a city like a competing the uh, Vienna. So they made a beautiful parliament, beautiful the uh, opera house, and very classic look, uh, uh, small little, uh, and it's not small, but beautiful city in Europe. So wherever you go, if you have a chance, go to the church, go to the mosque, go to the synagogue. That's where you see the, all the real life of locals. So I always go to the church, and then sometimes they allow you to take pictures, sometimes not. Uh, don't sneak in and try to take a picture, you know, if they, they might yell at you. Uh, but this one, obviously, I got a permission to follow the biggest mass, and just before the Christmas time, beautiful Mozart uh, requiem, they are singing, it was so emotional. And also capture the locals' uh, faces. You know, one is the uh, in the cemetery. People come to pray. Another, the uh, classic ballad is very strong in the uh, Hungary and the Budapest. So I try to capture those uh, faces of the people. And look at this. This is the uh, uh, opera house, uh, a little smaller than our opera house, the Metropolitan Opera House here. That is incredible design and the beauty. So this is how I built the infra infrastructure. Go to the iconic places. The one on the right is the uh, parliament, probably the, the most beautiful parliament in the world. Uh, you can go there. You can take pictures. And the, the hot spring is also very big, a part of the daily life. Uh, there are about 70, 80 public baths. It's part of their life. They go there. Gather in place again, the social life, and they play chess, and you know this is how they, they enjoy the life. Uh, of course, you need to capture the like uh, uh, signature building. Uh, this is called the chain uh, chain bridge, and they have to choose a nice light. Uh, there's another aspect, a cultural aspect. Always trying to capture the local culture. This is a porcelain uh, manufacturer place called Heranda. And uh, this uh, master is doing everything in the hand paint. So from cultural aspects, religious aspects, the daily life in the street, market, church, you have to combine all this to, to show what the city is about. OK, the second type of uh, travel story, which I will show you, is more, a little bit more specific. I, time to time, choose like a local industry which represent the place or represent the country. In this case, uh, I went to Mexico uh, and uh, to do the story of tequila. Uh, some of you who know me well, uh, if I say I'm going to do a tequila story, they think I'm crazy because I don't drink, I cannot drink. So if I have a one shot of tequila, I'll be probably down there or I'll be in the hospital. But I chose the subject because I want to see, I want to learn the spirit of Mexico. Nobody asked me to go there. I proposed the idea, and I want to do the tequila story. Okay. Uh, 
I don't know how much you know about tequila, some of, some of you, and tequila is really big in the U.S. now and over the last 10 years or so, particularly like a premium tequila, not to just get drunk. It's a very tasty and high quality uh, alcohol. And it's all made from these, you see like a pineapple look, like a fruit, it's called agave. And particularly a blue agave is the highest quality one. And the farmers come in early in the morning, they just cut into the, like a little, about this size. And then they transport, sometimes they put in the donkey, very poetic scene. Uh, so I started following in the production scene. scene. They bring it to the factory and the distillery. Uh, again, uh, if you're a fan of the uh, tequila, this is a dream assignment. Because they are so happy. I went to about five or 10 distillery, and they're so excited to have me, and uh, you know, since I cover and introduce in the magazine. But for me, they put 10 little uh, shots for me to tasting to do the tasting because I write text as well. So I have to taste and uh, take the notes, what's the texture and what's the taste and smell. And, but that was brutal for me. It was like a torture. So I was very careful not to drink. Obviously, if I drink the whole shot, I'm done. So just a little sip, little sip, little sip. But 10 of them, uh, tequila is like a 40% alcohol. So the whole day I was like, I, I visited like a three or four different distillery. I was like, oh, 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 oh. So some of my image could be a little out of focus, so that's my excuse, <laughs> okay? Uh, so distillery, they cut into the, uh, like, uh, the big, uh, we call it pina, into half, and put it in the oven. And they make it softer, and squeeze, and get the juice, and then ferment it. That fermentation makes like alcohol about 40%. And then the, through the, all the process of the scenery, uh, it gets even like a, a higher content, uh, concentration of the alcohol, about 50%. And they put the water, add the water, and uh, the most of the tequila is about 40% alcohol. So these are the very traditional, beautiful distillery. And now the uh, UNESCO made it like a, a world heritage uh, to, to preserve. As a, you see the color, different colors, uh, it's all dependent on the aging. So I was, so f I'm not like a wine alcohol specialist. I didn't take a picture of some of the, uh, the final products, but nothing like a wine magazine. Or, you know, my story is still travel, uh, trying to uh, encourage my reader to go to this destination. So, and also, the, they are combining this tequila industry into the local tourism. Tequila tourism is getting bigger. Same as like a Napa Bali, you know, bring the people to the winery and then they, they just uh, travel around the region, enjoy the scene, enjoy the experience, and they drink wine and they have a, a beautiful uh, dinner or something. Same thing. They brought the, uh, like, uh, from the capital of Jalisco State, the uh, Guadalajara, had a train, beautiful train. He got drunk in the, in the train and they enjoyed the meal. They have uh, entertaining dancers. And by the time they get to the uh, town of Tequila, there's a town called Tequila, actually. And then uh, uh, they go to the distillery. So it's a whole package. So my intention is trying to elucidate how they built like an economy based on one, you know, uh, uh, tequila industry. Uh, the Guadalajara, there is, uh, uh, there was the uh, beautiful Catholic uh, uh, procession. So I was also trying to capture those the uh, religious side again, same as the Rio, and same as the tequila. Mariachi is the spirit of Tex, te uh, the uh, Mexico. So I combined this. And uh, there's the uh, like a cowboys, and there's uh, like a kind of rodeo stuff. I forgot the name in Spanish, che che chereda, or something. And then they show off the technique of riding the horse and catching the horse, and all these people from uh, they are drinking tequila, of course, right? So this is a typical story 
based on these, uh, uh, the industry. I do a lot of uh, food story. Stupidly, I do follow the wine, although I don't drink, and uh, you know, I make the same mistake over and over. All right, uh, this one I probably skip because it's too much. But I do like a tea story in the Darjeeling in India. All right. All right, so let's go to a little more specific. And then the, some of the uh, tip and technique, hopefully you can uh, bring home and adapt to your next trip. OK. So how do you plan the trip? Uh, if you're trying to take a lot of pictures, how do I plan the trip? So I show you another example. Next one is more like the road trip. This is another type of travel photography. I drive the car myself, alone, and stop and take photo, stop and take photos. This time my, my subject was the uh, fall color, fall foliage, particular in Vermont, world famous uh, fall color place, and southern ca uh, Canada. Uh, some couple of years ago I did the story. So how do I prepare and research the, the subject and places? First thing, I read a lot of books. I look at the old coffee table books. Uh, anything you can get the visual and get the idea what I need to photograph. This is the uh, simplest thing. Google image. Put the keyword Vermont Fall and you get uh, hundreds of images. I'm not trying to copy those picture, but you might get, for example, uh, if you can see this. Like this picture, you know, is the uh, scene of like a farm, the barn, beautiful barn. How do I combine the full color with the barn? It's the picture of like a covered bridge. It's very typical in Vermont, very famous. So how do I find uh, that beautiful covered bridge with the full color? What about uh, like a typical town with the uh, beautiful church, how to combine it, where can I find it? What about the refraction on the lake and the pond with this particular peak of the color? So Google image, you get a lot of information because I've never been there at this, at this time of the year. i only been there for skiing, so I don't know where the colors. Instagram, well nowadays, the younger generation, everybody is in Instagram. That's another good source to get an idea what to do in Vermont. Uh, this, I just uh, pick up somebody's uh, 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 the account. Well, the problem, problem of Instagram is some could be uh, fake pictures. Some could be oversaturated. So you may not get the exact image, but still you can get some ideas. Also, I will highly recommend you uh, there are like uh, stock photo agencies and uh, nowadays everything is in online. This is what we call Shutterstock, which I also work with. And uh, You don't have to be a member, you don't have to pay anything. You just put a keyword, again, those images show up. And most of the cases these images are shot by the uh, professional, so quality is a little better than Instagram. And again, trying to get the idea. And I narrow it down, narrow it down, pick up the old idea. Eventually, this is a huge map uh, hanging on the, uh, in my office before the trip. So I put the, all the little dots, it's hard to see, and all the notes, and trying to plan how I go this the southern part of Vermont, about this area, this area. Normally, full foliage start from the uh, nose to south, obviously. The colder place is faster of the peak time. So I plan, okay, let's start the uh, travel in Canada. A little by little going down to south to the Vermont. But nature doesn't work that way. So I have to go back and forth, back and forth, go around. And this, the, uh, over the two, three weeks time, I had to drive 3,000, 4,000 miles 
to find the actual spot. Uh, this up there is the border of Canada and the U.S. And I have to go back and forth so many times and crossing the border. Luckily, the, the border is very remote, so there are not many people go going back and forth. But still went back so many times. Eventually, the, uh, of course, the officer stopped me and asked me, why do you have to go back and forth that many times in such a short time? Wow, I said I am chasing uh, full color and taking picture. Obviously, they, they don't believe me, and they start searching my car, and do you have a food? Of course, and that kind of trip. My car is my restaurant, so I, I put them, the maps and the equipment, the dirty uh, food all over, and they, they search everywhere. But I still go, went back and forth, and they eventually they see my face. Hey, you come back again? All right, go ahead. How is your picture going? So I, I met a friend over there. But anyway, this is how travel. So this is the first picture on um, that uh, uh, the magazine article. You know, find the beautiful the uh, red burn. This is actually a very famous place for like even even now with all the Instagram photographers, they want to go there this time of the year. So combining the barn and beautiful, perfect shape of the farm. And this is the uh, air shot in, uh, uh, in the southern ca uh, Canada, the uh, uh, state park. So that's why I have to go back and forth. I was waiting and waiting till the, the peak time. I went back, not enough. I went back, not enough. Finally, third time, OK, this day, today, I can fly. Uh, and I found a little pond. This is not even in, in, in the map. So I, I talked to the locals, and they, get, they, they started again, realizing, I mean, noticing me. Oh, you come back again. Today is the day. You have to go. Because the color is there, and there is no wind. So you get the perfect reflection. But it's not only the, the, uh, the foliage. So I was trying to cover the local life. This is a harvesting scene. I visited the, uh, one of the, the apple farm to capture the moment of the harvesting joy and the, uh, the nature over there. Although those trees are not absolutely natural, but the people designed the landscape. So that's the difference between, you know, it's very different from like uh, faraway mountains and Rockies. This is people designed, you know, human elements. Uh, uh, beautifully done the uh, 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 landscape. And I went to like uh, the cheese factory and uh, interviewed them and they're in the process, the final process of making the cheese. Um, I, since I had to write the text as well, so I interviewed a lot of people and they said, even for the locals, Vermont, the uh, peak of the fall season is a, a kind of a happy and sad moment because they enjoy the color, of course, that this is the beginning of a dark, harsh winter. The winter is just around the corner. So it's like a mm, very, very uh, complex moment for them. So I captured all these, OK? Uh, uh, cable car in San Francisco. Maybe I have the time. How much time? I have half an hour. Right. Uh, another story. Uh, very spe specific theme in the city. San Francisco, beautiful city with the, with the slope and the bay, but I just focus on cable car. Cable car is the signature of the town, uh, and by following the path of the people who use it, who maintain it, you know, uh, this is how I combine the uh, trouble story. Same way, check in the uh, uh, Google image, get all the ideas. Okay, where is the best slope? Where is the, uh, the turntable? Where is the uh, uh, signature image combining the uh, bay and all these? Same thing, Instagram is not a particularly good picture, but you may get some idea. Uh, the stock images, all right. So the first image again, I put all the essence of the town, the city, the beautiful bay and the Alcatraz uh, Island. The signature image is San Francisco. 
And this is a Hyde Street, the one of the steepest the, uh, hill. And uh, this particular uh, cable car is very popular among locals as well as the uh, tourists. Because it's more like uh, Disneyland, going down and up, down. Uh, so I chose this image for the starting of the uh, article. So where can I find the steepest slope? Where can I combine the sunset with the uh, cable car? Those are the idea. I already had it before, and of course, it doesn't work. You know, as I plan, I have to try an area all the time. And believe it or not, this is a very manual labor kind of operation. I don't know if you have ever took the uh, the cable car in San Francisco. If you if you have never done it, please do so. Uh, you know how the cable car works in there? This is the only town in the world. They have a little rail under the ground, and there's a cable running and moving. One hand is like uh, uh, the factory constantly moving, and they make a loop. loop. And uh, the cable car underneath, they have a, what they call grip, and they catch the cable, and the car whole thing smooth. And they release it, they stop. Very primitive kind of uh, operation. But they still do it. And then once they got to the one station A to station B, at the end, they have to turn around, push him by hand, manually. So this is one of the, uh, uh, the uh, turnaround turntable. And of course, I need to uh, capture this. And every day after work, they bring the car back to the factory, and uh, this is, this one is a grip. It sits in the middle of the car and grab it, uh, so they need to they maintain every day. So behind the scene. Uh, and how people use the cable car, how they treat it. This is the uh, moment of the uh, University of California Berkeley student, Carl. And uh, one day before the big uh, football match, so they got into the cable car and then the promote in the cable car, the tomorrow's game. So this is the part of their identity and their life. Okay, so uh, once you plan the whole trip uh, and you know you check where I want to go, uh, what I want to take, and then, once you arrive, how do you plan that day, day of the shoot? Uh, most important timing of the day for all us photographers is the golden hours, we call. It's said right before it gets completely dark, but dark enough you start getting the lights from the building, uh, street, cars. Uh, this, this is a, you know, you, you don't get this kind of color all the time, but you definitely get the lights every single night. So particularly you are in a city with artificial light, how we plan the day, we pick up where we're going to spend today at 6 o'clock for half an hour or an hour and to get this sexy light. If you have a five days in one city, you have five opportunities to get five different images. So this is how we plan. Uh, then plan the rest of the day. This is again a Caputo Pest, and uh, I was there about two weeks. Every single day, I choose, OK, where do I pick the, the spot to get this beautiful, sexy light? Again, it's not completely dark. That's why you get all the detail even in the shadow. And then dark enough to get the reflection on the water and the, uh, the light from the building. <coughs> Buenos Aires. Uh, this is we call the Paris in South America. Very, very European taste. Combining European sophistication and Latin American passion. So I need a one picture to show the, uh, uh, the feel of the town. And this is the main square with all the traffic around. And this is the parliament in the, in the back. And this is about 
Normally, sunset, if like at 6.30 is the sunset, completely down, you have to wait another half an hour or so. And there's a, the, like, uh, the about 15 minutes window, you can get this kind of light. There's only one very short time a day, but if you get this kind of picture, you're a winner. This is Kyoto in Japan, uh, back alley, beautiful uh, slope with the stone, both sides of the uh, uh, traditional houses and tea houses, and standing pagoda on the back. But you can see the sky is not completely dark. That's why you can see the, all the details still, but dark enough to get the street light. Same thing. Rio, uh, same uh, uh, beautiful bay with the, uh, the uh, what's the name of the bay? Yeah, Sugar Lope is the background. Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, uh, street light. Again, this is only like a 15 minutes window. You have to plan. But there are many tools nowadays in the online. Okay, today, sunrise, what time? Sunset, what time? Moonrise, moonset. You have to put all the data in your hand and plan the day. And plan for the most important picture of the day. This is how we do. On the other hand, if you are in the nature, obviously you do not have the artificial light. But you have two moments, sunrise and sunset. Those are the most important time of the day. This is Patagonia. That's where I do the I conduct the photography program every six months. And in fact, this is like two minutes out from uh, my room. So our hotel sits in an incredible place, which I will talk you I talk about later on. But this is sunrise. About uh, I don't know, six thirty sunrise. The best time sunrise means the sun comes up from the horizon. So the best time again, if the sun, sunrise 6.30, probably 5.45, 5.30, around that range, you may get the color like this. OK? So I plan the day to capture this. But what does it mean? If you go there, 5 o'clock, 5.30, it's completely dark. So you have to go there a day before to check the place, what do you see? The mountains, the dead tree, a lake, and you have to kind of pre-visualize what might happen with the color in it. And you have to check the, all the ground, is it safe? Is this a stable place to put the tripod and all these? You have to be there a day before. This is how we plan. Easter Island, that's also another destination, and take my guests. Uh, this is a sunrise. Uh, we start uh, uh, setting up the tripod in the complete darkness. And of course, you need to know the place. When I take my guests over there, they have no idea. We are in the pitch dark. What, what's there? And there's actually like a 15 big stone moai statues. But you don't know it. But if you are alone, if you plan something like this, you have to go there a day before and check the location and setting and check the timing of the sunrise and be there like an hour, one hour before, OK? And I knew exactly the angle of the sun. There's another tool that you can check. If we have time, I'll show you. Same thing in the sunrise in Easter Island. The, uh, uh, the coastline, sun is just coming out, the color constantly changing, the texture constantly changing. I use a long shadow speed to get the feel of the movement of the water. This is sunset. OK. Uh, up in the uh, uh, northern Chile called the Atacama Desert. And then this is after the sunset. Sunset means sun goes in on the horizon. And a lot of time, if I go there, there are some tourists going there to try to capture the sunset because they, this is a very famous spot for the sunset. But as soon as they catch the picture, goes down, they all go. We are the only ones. Stay there another hour, hour and a half, up until complete darkness. And normally about 
30 minutes, 45 minutes after the sun goes down, then we got the color. So again, we had to plan that. All right, so next, even more pro, uh, technical and more specific, and hopefully you can adapt those uh, tips and technique in your next coming trip. Composition, finding drama. Composition is like a very, very personal choice. This is actually the, the subject and theme for me to teach most difficult, because you choose what to include, how you design the frame, what you do not want to include. So uh, it's a personal choice, but there are some tricks might work, particularly like a landscape, which I will show you. Uh, Patagonia game, beautiful mountain, beautiful lake, beautiful foreground, and it looks, I mean, this is my picture, I can't really say this is the greatest picture, but it works. Why does it work? Because on purpose I chose this framing. Okay, Patagonia or the, some other place that I show you, breathtaking. Every corner, wow, wow. But it doesn't mean you get the greatest picture. You point it out quick, no. You have to have a certain plan and a certain way to see the nature. Nature is a ground designer. They are the genius. But you have to train your eyes what you see, where you focus. OK, this case, why it works? Because it's multiple layers. One layer on the foreground, middle layer on the water, Another layer of green and mountain cloud. So I put multiple layers into one frame. Often time, if you have a multiple layers, the picture works stronger. Same thing. Layers after layers. Water, glacier, stone, and another other mountain, and cloud and sky. So I put the multiple layers. As many as you can put it, the image look stronger. Second thing, curves. If you find the curves in the frame, that will give you a additional rhythm. This one, this curves, and particularly this finish all the way to the corner. If this curve finish about here, may not work. If it finish all the way to the corner, you get the sense of the stretches, you know, even like wider. So I was traveling myself, and I saw, ooh, this is a nice curve with the uh, uh, mountain as a background. So I climb up to this little hill and find this spot. Uh, so if you are paying attention, okay, where's the curve? Where's the layer? Then eventually you will find amazing design that nature can only make. Same thing, curves. I found the uh, floating uh, ice, the uh, iceberg uh, coming from the uh, glacier. The curves start from the corner. OK, this is a nice <coughs> curve. That gives you another rhythm. Curve, this 500 cows moving one station to the other, pushing by the local gauchos, the cowboys. And I position myself on top of the hill, and I knew there was a curve and they are coming towards us. So that's why I put this all the way to the curb of the corner. Third thing, uh, a lot of uh, landscape, for landscape photographers, I'm not a landscape photographer, uh, but landscape photographers, they hate to put these like a people, car, boat, in the beautiful landscape. I love it. Why? There are two reasons. This is a gla glacier, and again in the, uh, Patagonia, Chile, uh, this wall where the, the glacier finish break into the water, about 30, 40 meters. I don't know how much in height, uh, feet. Uh, but anyways, enormous wall. And without this little boat and people, you don't know how big it is. So put the scale, the sense of scale is very important, even in the uh, landscape. 
So I was waiting and waiting, waiting until something comes into my frame. So get the sense of the scale, get the sense of drama. So that's how we create the drama in the landscape picture. Same thing. This is called Lensois Maranhão in uh, uh, Northeast Brazil, which I'm heading in two weeks. Uh, this is a sand, white sand dune, and only in the uh, rainy season you got the, uh, the rain, then the beautiful blue, green, the uh, uh, water comes out. So stretches of the sand dune after sand dune, and yes, it's beautiful, but I wanted to have the uh, people coming in, waiting, 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 until these two guys, and there's also another people up here, coming into my frame. That way you feel the size of the place and get another sense of the drama. Same thing. This is the uh, Uyuni Salt Flat, the world's biggest salt lake up in the uh, uh, Andes Mountain in Bolivia. I don't know if you have heard of it. It's another photographer's dream place. And I often go there for doing the workshop up there. Uh, so this is my car, my crew. They are waiting for me. Where is Katsu? Uh, we need to go back, and it gets dark and dark. I know, but I have to take pictures. So I was on top of this uh, little uh, island, and then I was actually waiting for them coming into my frame. Please. Uh, so of course they yell at me at the end, but you know I got a picture. So what the heck? So. All right, uh, this is East Island, we call the uh, uh, quarry. That's where they dig the, uh, the stone and curve this crazy big stone statue. I found interesting zigzag form. Another zigzag here, another zigzag. Okay, interesting formation. So nice, nice design. But mm, I'm missing something. What are you, uh, what are you missing? A people. So I was waiting for people to come into my frame. And the guy was uh, red shirts like you, like you. And red has to be red. Why? The, yeah, contrast. Red and green are opposite color in the color spectrum. So that's why red stands out more than any other color. It can't be a yellow. It can't be blue. It has to be red. So I oftentimes wait for the people in a red shirt or a red jacket, red car, anything red. Whew, I get so excited. Uh, OK, here's another way how I create the drama in the frame. This is uh, up in Nosin uh, Atacama Desert. Uh, this orange color, actually, this is not a rock. This is a salt, salt formation. It's a salt like, uh, salt like all the salt a mineral came from the Andes Mountain and after the thousand and thousand of years. Okay, so I found a beautiful sunset scene of the mountain, nice layers, water, but I kind of plan it, pre visualize. Okay, what's going to happen if I put little people here? What's going to happen if I got the flamingo? Even like a flying. This lake, there's a little tiny little like a shrimp, like a pinkish color of shrimp. That's what the uh, flamingo come and eat. That's why they got so pink. So I knew there was a pass right here that people can walk through. OK, so people must be coming in. And I was waiting for two people rather than one. I was ideally like a couple. And there's another two flamingo accidentally come into my frame just under the layer of the blue against and pink against blue. OK, the final element, flying flamingo into my frame. So one, two, three elements. I planned that. Out of about two hours of shooting, hundreds of shots, I only got one picture. So I was the winner. So this is how I pre-visualize, set the frame, plan, think about what the drama could happen, and wait. 
Of course, you cannot wait randomly. You observe the situation. Maybe people come in, in. maybe the flamingo come in, in. This is how you create the drama in the frame. One more. This is, again, Patagonia. Uh, very cloudy, overcast, misty days. Uh, cannot see any mountain on top. So, hmm, this is interesting reflection, nice palm. Then I notice there are animals up there. We call it wanako. It's like a camel look like a wana uh, wild animals. You see hundreds of them in Patagonia. And they are moving on this direction. Little by little, stop and eat. Very lazy, stop and eat. So I was, mm, this is my frame. I set my frame. They need to come into my frame. And finally, they came into my frame. You see the wanako jump into the water? Right? And then, this is a shot I got <coughs> after. So I had the plan. I had a visualization, pre-visualization, what could happen with the drama, all the elements. But it's not like I was there, immediately there. No. I position myself and mm, think about a frame and just observe the surrounding and this old element came into my frame. Okay, very different type of photography. Street photography, that was the landscape. Now I will show you how to take uh, people pictures. Uh, I also conduct a lot of uh, uh, program uh, photo trip into my dear country, Japan, uh, like three times a year. But this is actually not a Japan. Uh, Rio again. Uh, street photography. Important thing is, uh, you know, you have to get the sense of the place. So this is real, uh, Ipanema Beach. After the street carnival, people just hang around, doing nothing, just having a great time. So first, I saw a beautiful, unique shape of mountain. This is the signature of Rio. And sunset, the color, this emotional, sen uh, sentimental feel, lighting and the uh, palm tree, that set the tone. Okay, I like this place. And I like this uh, group of girls, maybe 13, 14, early teens, very sensual actually, whether they are conscious or not. This is very typical real girls. Okay, I chose the gang of girls. This is my target. Obviously, with a big camera, Asian look, I don't belong there. I don't belong, belong at all. I look so odd. So I just stand out, and uh, those, those girls are uh, kind of very suspicious. What this guy is trying to take a picture of me? And, uh, uh, and they are shy, and sometimes they are like a giggling and uh, peace, and you know, that's a terrible picture. So what I did, I didn't talk to them on this time. I stay there five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, pretend to take some other scene over there, over here. Eventually, they start losing attention. The attention span, most of the time, is not that long. Even I am <laughs> this close, and with the big camera, of course, first five minutes, they're absolutely aware of my existence. But eventually, they don't care. They have their own issues. So. Uh, I kept shooting, I kept clicking to wait until the moment comes, and finally, this is a shot I got, and she's absolutely, you know, relaxing, she doesn't care about me. I am not visible. So that's the key of the uh, street photography. If I am using a long lens far away and take a picture that they don't allow, you know, realize, that's not a picture. It's a stealing image for me. It's not really a picture, taking picture. So you've got to be close, this close. And obviously, it's very intimidating, particularly like a big camera pointing out. They don't like it. But that's why time is very important. Be patient and try to be invisible. Eventually, it happens. Same thing in Tokyo. Back alley in Tokyo, in Shinjuku, where the old skyscraper, modern city, but there's a little stretch 
about five minutes walk, very small. Lots of bars and restaurants. The beauty of that place is, I mean, this all looked like a pre-war kind of feel, and I always uh, take my guests to, to photograph, to practice the street photography. The beauty of this place, those bars are open. The storefront is open, and you can see inside what's there. The guys are drinking, get drunk. At the same time, the street, this little narrow street, you can capture booths. So that's why I love it. So obviously, I stand at the corner of the street. He knows me. He knew I was there. He knew I was taking a picture. Again, trying to pretend this, pretend this. Eventually, I'm not visible for him. He doesn't care. He doesn't see me. That's when finally I start clicking. That's street photography. Uh, another street photography in Kyoto. Set the tone, beautiful corner, uh, nice alley, and wait until the drama happens. This is probably the, the most popular photography spot in the entire Japan right now. And, and uh, it's in Kyoto. And Kyoto is the number one tourist destination right now, uh, believe it or not. And it's not really good for me because there are too many people coming in. So uh, this is called uh, uh, Fushimi Inari, the shrine with the thousand of uh, orange gates. Everybody wants to go there. So to avoid all the cloud, we have to go there in the dark, pitch dark, and start the, uh, the shooting. Uh, but this one, is a very, I was very lucky. This guy carrying with the case, inside is a food offer to the god on top of the hill. So he comes and back every morning to bring the food to the shrine god um, very high on top, uh, on top of the hill. So I just happened to save him. OK, just set the frame again that the drama came in. Another street uh, is called very, uh, uh, again, very popular spot uh, in the middle of uh, Tokyo, Shibuya Crossing. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five different crossing, huge area. In a busy day, about 500 people or so crossing in five minutes. And since I grew up there, it, it was a very normal thing to watch. The particular people coming from overseas, they are amazed because Nobody hit, nobody touch. They just go smooth, even like a packed area. So we call it like uh, organized chaos. It's a chaotic, but it's Japan, so everything is so organized. Uh, so we got little down. The best day to do this kind of shoot, rainy day, of course, with the umbrella. At the end of the day, in the evening, and uh, Sunday or Saturday, so Rainy Sunday evening is the perfect three, three m and all together. And I was there, luckily. And we go on the ground, of course. You have to immerse yourself in the middle of a cloud. That's very typical. And by the way, Japan is probably the, the, the best spot, uh, place to practice the street photography. Because if you point at the camera and this close, nobody yell at you. If I do these things in New York, I'm in trouble. They will yell at me, they throw in, and so nothing happened like this in Japan. So I, I tell my students, my guests, you know, this is the best place, so you got to be close. Anyway, uh, another street packed, typical on Sunday in Tokyo. You can't move. This is a station, train station, and this stretch of street is finished about here. In the normal day, you can walk in like five, seven minutes from there to there. In this kind of situation, it will take hour, over an hour, because you sometimes stay there, wait. So this, the first image I want to capture is this condensed, compressed feel of the packed streets. And of course, I have to go inside there and get those kind of street photography. Uh, street photography is way more difficult than like a landscape for me because it has to be spontaneous. You know, the subjects constantly moving. There are additional elements, additional elements could be distraction. And so you have to find the, uh, the place 
like a sensor place, as I told you at the beginning. Uh, this is a fashion, like a young fashion uh, town where the older kids and the teenagers come. Uh, on the other hand, this is uh, in Peru, uh, near Cusco, Sacred Valley. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, I do the uh, program also in, in, uh, in Cusco every August. Festival is a wonderful moment that you can do the uh, street photography. So if you have a plan to go to some other city for vacation, if you have a chance to change or adjust your schedule, first check the local event calendar. If there is any religious uh, ceremony, procession, any kind of local festival, that day you need to be there. Uh, Peru is kind of opposite of Japan. It's a very difficult place to take a picture of people. Most of the time, they're very shy. They don't like to be photographed. Or if they're OK, they will ask you a money for peanut, mm -hmm. which I don't want to do it. Uh, but only the festival time, they love to be photographed. So again, on the street, I am this close. And I push all my guests be there right in front of them and take the picture with a wider angle not using a long lens far away, don't steal the image. That's not street photography. You have to be this close. Uh, one more thing. If you go to like a festival, procession, anything, uh, maybe day earlier or earlier of the day, go there, talk to the organizer, and check the route where they're going to walk. This one particular very small village. And there are not many tours. We are the only one take photos. And I talk to the organizer where they're going to walk through. That way, I can pre-visualize again, plan that background. Same group will be moving all around. But if there is like an ugly store, storefront, you know, like uh, the electric pole, doesn't work. You have to choose the right background, even though these guys the main cast. So I went there and particularly choose, wow, this is a nice, lasty, uh, the, uh, the Matty wall, nice street, no distraction. So you have to choose planet. So again, if you're on, on your own, traveling, go to some city and trying to take a picture, you have to choose a location. And also, before the parade or uh, procession starts, like at, at least two hours, Go there. And that's the most interesting time of taking the pictures. You know, they are in, in the process of preparation, and they are not like a formal. OK? All right. You OK? OK. The final, final part of this, uh, the presentation, I will show you. One of my workshops uh, in uh, Patagonia and East Island. I, uh, about eight or ten uh, workshops, uh, different destination, dis different country I conduct. I'm on the road and taking my guests and go there. Together we shoot. Every night we come back to the hotel. We do the critique like this with the, the big screen, looking at their images one by one. And I will talk about, OK, this can be done, this can be done, this is a great trial. And then this is how I conduct the uh, photography workshop. Uh, particularly Patagonia and East Island, I go there every six months. I have designed this program after going there many times, doing the old magazine story. And I know this place so well. And I see a lot of people come in, bring a beautiful camera, same as mine or better than mine. And then they don't know how to, how to use it. So I, I, I have a partnership, the Explorer Hotel, uh, it's like a resort hotel in uh, 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 Chile. And then uh, uh, I propose a, a photography program uh, to them. And then immediately we start working. Nikon also uh, sponsor my program. They support equipment. So anybody who come with a camera, uh, you can use our camera without any extra fee. 
So there are like a total beginners, novice people, to the totally uh, high advanced uh, uh, amateur. Uh, so we go to this uh, crazy nature place. Patagonia is not a country. It's a region down at the bottom of South America in between Argentina and Chile. And we go to the Chilean side called uh, Tode, this uh, uh, Piney, Piney National Park. It's a photographer's the dream place. A lot of people go there and capture incredible images. And I limit the number of eight marks. So it's a very small group. Uh, believe it or not, these are very popular destinations nowadays. I see sometimes like a photographer bringing like a 20 people, 30 people doing a workshop. I cannot do that because eight people I can pay attention to every single photographer's to your need and check your camera screen. Okay, we constantly can talk, but 20, 30 people, you can't do that. And you can't share the space like this. Uh, Patagonia is famous for that wind, world's strongest wind. Wind is your friend, best friend, and your enemy. So this kind of picture, you cannot imagine this kind of the size of the cloud. It's all because of the wind. Wind makes the pattern on the, on the cloud. This is what we call lenticular cloud. And uh, the magnitude of the wind, I have, I'll show you. This is the tripod I use, super heavy. I don't know how many pounds. And with this tripod, and put the biggest camera on top, and trying to do the sunrise, sunset, whole thing can be blown out by the wind. So oftentimes, we have to sit down to avoid the wind. Or sometimes, we hide behind the little hill to avoid the wind. I put the car. And we just sit behind this the, uh, crazy wind, OK? Uh, Sorry. Not at all. So this is the kind of wind you have to fight with. Do you see a little, a little of the, uh, it's not a little, big uh, passenger bus here? For the 30, 40 people you can sit in, uh, some years ago, that size of bat fell down by the wind. One blow. <laughs> so you can imagine how difficult to photograph in that kind of a situation. But let's go back. Thanks to the wind, the cloud constantly moving. So in the moment with the pouring rain, the next moment you got the blue sky, and another moment, snowing. So we call it like we have a four season in the day. That's Patagonia. So that's why the change of the color, tone, scene, constantly changing. On the other hand, Isa Island, that's another destination I combine. Actually, the two of you just came. Uh, who came who are my former guests and who did all this crazy stuff. And I hope they don't hate me now. So of course, this island is very famous for the Moai statues. You know, they are very mysterious stones sitting in the middle of nowhere, no reason. And the island itself so far uh, from Santiago, the main capital of the uh, Chile, you take about five and a half hours, almost like an international flight to go to the island. Uh, it's a world most, uh, I mean, remote inhabited island. That means there's no island, no land nearby. It's on their own universe. So people, back, back then when they make the uh, Moai, they had no idea the rest of the world, okay? So the one of the highlight we do over there is like a star shooting. And uh, there's no other place in the world. 
you can do light painting and the star, the, uh, the Moai statue as our target. And we combine the star. And uh, this is a shot of about 80, 100, or maybe 80 or 100 pictures all together into one. So we do those kind of crazy stuff. But because of this, our days are crazy long. Uh, you don't sleep. We, f we start the, the, well, ask them. Uh, we start today like uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. Before sun comes up, that little window of night, we do the stars. Because sometimes we have to play with the uh, moonlight. If moon is there, we cannot do this. Uh, depending on the time of the day, I mean the uh, uh, year, sometimes we have the full moon to avoid that. We have to choose those kind of crazy hours. But anyway, my trip is always like long days and uh, full, of, full of activity, then they call it like a photography boot camp. And it is a boot camp. Again, we take a boat, like a closer to the glacier. And uh, thanks to my partner, they have their own catamaran boats. They have their own like uh, uh, horses and uh, gaucho, the cowboys, uh, or sometimes take a small boat out on the ocean in East Island. I am allowed to use all these logistics together with the local guide who come with us whole time, and they will give us like uh, information about geology, uh, history, fauna, all these information together. Because it's so important to understand the location. What is the meaning of the shape of them? Why the mountain looks like this? You need to know before you click. So that's how I try to combine. And again, it's the Gray Glacier and gets so close to the, uh, the, uh, the, the face of the, uh, the huge ice. And sometimes we take the horse. We do the horseback riding. This is the best way to feel the beauty of the Patagonia, or we are taking a picture of the gaucho running back and forth. I set up like a two horses, two gauchos running back and forth. Can you try one more time? Can you make it a little faster? Rapido, rapido, or we do like a panning shot. Also. So we learn action shoot. And our hotel sits right in front of massive Thanks to this, believe it or not, this picture I shot in my room. I had a pajama and a hot chocolate and a click. <laughs> and so you get this. I mean, there's no other place in the world you can get this kind of picture in your room. So every morning, I set the time for the sunrise shoot for everybody. Uh, we go out in the dark and shoot the sunrise, but if it's pouring, pouring rain, there's nothing you can do. So we can do this kind of shoot in the room. Or I say this is your vacation. So if you want to skip it, you know, you don't have to come out every single morning. But most of the time, they don't skip anything. They come every single morning. At the end of the trip, they got so tired, happily exhausted. They're so happy to go, to go back to home to work. So this is a kind of a trip. East Island. You know, surrounded by those kind of cultural issue, uh, cultural uh, uh, scene, and we set up like uh, the contacting local is very important in Thailand. So I cho I choose the uh, locals, and she's actually the uh, professional dancer, uh, local islanders. Beautiful. She's got the uh, beautiful tattoo all over her body, and we do the like, uh, portrait shooting practice over there. And uh, in the morning, we go out to the uh, coastline and uh, take a picture of the enormous waves crashing into the beach of the uh, rocks. So by doing this, we may get the picture like this in sunrise. And uh, I show you some crazy shots. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize who that is. Very stupid guy. This is me. And then as the waves come in closer and closer, I want to capture the big wave. Eventually, it gets this close, this big. And I was so lucky not to be washed away. That's why I'm here. So as you can see, I'm silly and stupid sometimes. 
but hopefully you can come and join me in this uh, once in a lifetime experience. Uh, so journey continues, and uh, I do a program in Patagonia, East Island. I do a program in Peru and Bolivia, Japan, New York. So this is my uh, the top one is the Nikon's the website uh, that you can check the, all the detail of my program in Patagonia, East Island. My website, my Instagram. So thanks for watching this and. Uh, in another 10 minutes or so, I will explain about uh, a little bit about equipment. Are you okay? Yes. All right. So, out of six months a year, I'm on the road and always carry the big equipment and cameras. And a lot of people ask me, how do you travel? How do you pack? Nowadays, the uh, airport regulation is getting tougher and tougher and uh, the limitation of the weight size of the bag is getting even tougher. So this is my typical camera bag. Number one rule, you never check in your luggage. So you have to carry on. You have to take. This is just, I don't know if you can see. This is just a regular, it's just so heavy, regular look carrying suitcase. Another rule. Since I go to so many places carrying on all the other equipment, I have to look. I mean, I, I try not to look like a photographer. If you can obviously tell, like a camera fancy bag, you know, there are pros all over uh, targeting you, watching you all the time. So I look like a regular tourist. Nobody really imagined there are bunch of camera gears in there. That way I can avoid any kind of issue. So I use this uh, uh, carry-on uh, little suitcase, fits to the uh, cabin in the, in the airplane, and just a regular backpack. This, I have all the, the uh, computers and uh, accessories and all of my value, uh, valuable stuff like a passport or everything. But some airport, some airplane, or some uh, airline person at the gate, it really, really depends on the person. They could be really grouchy, very tough on you, and they come to me. It doesn't happen that much, but it may happen. Uh, can I wait your camera? That's the end of my day. Because my camera back had uh, maybe like a three camera bodies, three different zoom lenses, a couple more, uh, external hard drive, accessory. It, it is super heavy. But I always like, like I try to move so smooth and uh, pretend like I'm just a tourist. OK? But if they stop it and wait it, and they open it, what is this? And they don't allow me to go in. So I have to have a backup plan. Back in the back, this is a smaller back. It's called, a, you know, how dirty and this is worn out. I've been using almost like a 20 years. Uh, the camera back company, they don't make it anymore, but you, you call it like a berry back around the waist. And then I put like a two camera body and two lenses. If they said it's too heavy, I take this out. And the, some of the most valuable, particularly like a shot image and external hard drive, you can't miss it. This is more important than the camera gears. So I take it, put this into my backpack. So eventually, this camera case got empty. OK, you can check in. But all my gears can be hidden in here, can be hidden here. So I always have to have a backup. Uh, particularly nowadays, they, you know, the equipment are getting so better and better, and people want to carry this camera, that camera, this lens. You got so many stuff in it, so you have to have a backup plan. Okay. So in this camera bag, I have uh, D5, the A50, and uh, three different zoom lens: 1424, 24-70, 70-200. That's normal lens for the professionals, or even like uh, you know higher amateurs an additional macro lens, and two external hard drive, 
Uh, I don't have a time to talk about all the digital photography workflow today, but everybody, even like uh, vacation photographers, making a backup of your precious, precious images is so important. It, a lot of people underestimate it, and something happened to the uh, memory card or camera or the computer, and you lose the whole thing. So first thing I will tell my guests, make at least, well, no, has to be two backup. Sometimes you lose the whole thing. Well, you lose it, you pour the coffee, water, and then uh, you lose everything. But if you have second backup, your image is safe. So it's very, very time consuming, bothering. Every day you come back to the hotel room, you have to download all the images into your camera, I mean into your computer, and make a two backup into the additional external hard drive. No matter how many pictures you take, some people keep using the same memory card the entire trip and do not make any backup or entire year. And memory card is not a storage. It could, anything could happen. So that's a very important process. Make a backup. Anyway, so uh, after all traveling all these uh, same, same camera, new technology came in last year, thanks to the Nikon. Uh, Z system, well this is something uh, very technical from now. Uh, full frame mirrorless camera came in last year. So it's called the Z7 and Z6 and Z format lenses. This is this small, tiny, very light. Personally, I don't really care how heavy or how light the camera is. I actually, I prefer heavier camera. This is D5. See how different size is, right? Uh, the reason is, in a situation like uh, Patagonia, crazy wind, if I have this tiny little camera and a big lens, it's constantly moving with the, uh, with the, the wind. So bigger camera is easier for me to hold tight, even on the long lens. That's why I prefer using the bigger, heavier, bulky camera. But this Z series, like particularly this Z7, which I've been using almost like 80% now, uh, tiny but very easy to hold. The way they designed the body and lenses. This is a new, brand new lens called uh, uh, Z2.8 uh, 24-70. Probably the Z best lens in the industry right now. Uh, if you're interested, this is the one. This is my go-to lens now. See, it's very compact. So particularly like uh, street photography I show you, you know, instead of this big, intimidating big camera, this is way nicer, you know. And if I do the uh, trekking and hiking and long day of work, obviously light weight uh, camera start helping me a lot. Uh, but Thanks to the uh, what we call FTZ uh, uh, adapter, you can still use the uh, older lenses. If uh, you are in the middle of switching from uh, regular DSL camera to Z lenses, I mean D, uh, the, the, the uh, Z uh, system, you can still use the uh, uh, older lenses. This one, I have an adapter. This is my, my favorite lens, 1424, 2.8, older lens, and then it's Feels very nice. What else? Uh, yeah. So, the it's for me the most important thing is of course the camera is nice, but new type of lenses, Z lenses, is a little bigger form. The window size is bigger. That means more information is coming through the camera. That means the quality of the image is better now. So again, if you're thinking about okay. The mirrorless, I don't know, but the future of Nikon, the Nikon guy just stepped out now, but uh, the future of Nikon is this new technology of lenses. That's where we all switch towards anyway. 
because uh, because of the quality. It's not about the size. It's not about the weight. It's about the quality. That's what they are talking about. Okay. All right. So this is all my presentation. I hope you pick something new and enjoy it. Thank you very much. You know.